now, as you can see, we're going to have a more intimate moment. Uh, so we can have a, a discussion, of course. So what we're going to do is to have a discussion about media and information literacy in education. I'm going to present our conferences. Uh, they are Carolyn Wilson, President, Association for Media Literacy of Canada, uh, Tapio Vadis, University of Tempere, Finland, Alfonso Gutierrez, University of Valladolid, Spain, and we have also Johan Holmberg from Folk, Folket's Bio Film, Film Pedagogierna from Sweden. And of course, we have our moderator, Alton Grissel from UNESCO. Thanks all of you for being here, and uh, you can start this discussion now. Thank you very much. Welcome to the uh, UNESCO UNSC Millid talk show. It's the number one talk show in the world, and um, we're putting Oprah Winfrey in trouble. Please cut that piece. <laughs> uh, but welcome back. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I want to speak for the organizers. We are behind time. We have decided to cut this session short. And you can help us if you return on time to, this, to the sessions. Um, as we said, this, um, this, this, this third session of the day will be focusing on the integration of media and information literacy in education. Um, I think we would all agree that um, incorporating information literacy, media and information literacy in education is the ultimate strategy to achieving MIL as, in, as an engaging civic education movement. It's not the only strategy, but it's the ultimate strategy to ensure that um, our, our um, our ministries of education develop policies to make um, MIL compulsory education. Um, now, of course, um, this is no easy feat. This is no easy task. It's, it's a process uh, that will evolve over time. And you'll be hearing from some of the speakers um, that are on the panel, uh, for, for example, Carolyn, you know, it's over 20 years it took before um, um, it became official policy for MIL to be uh, integrated in education in Canada. Um, in, in other countries, in Australia, in, in Sri Lanka, in Argentina, there are similar policies, but also a long journey for that to happen. Here in Europe, there, there was a resolution of the European Parliament to make uh, media literacy compulsory in all levels of education. But of course, take up at different member states, is, is, there's a divergence, there is a, there is a disparity in, in take up. So it's, it's not easy. So now we're going to focus on looking at perspectives and experiences in integrating media and information literacy in education. What are some of the challenges? What are some of the strategies to make it happen? And um, what are some of the best practices? Our first speaker will be um, Mr. Tape Vari. Uh, Tape is a board member of the International Institute for Information Technology in Education. He's also the principal researcher, uh, researcher um, of the, U the UN um, Vocational Educational Center. And he's a global thinker with over 40 years of research and publication in the academic world. So Tape, over to you. Thank you very much. One moment. Uh, do I open it here? What do you want? I have not pressed up my meals and PowerPoint. Start coming on. Muchas gracias. Buen día. Thank you very much. I try to speak English. I it's not my language, but but it's a common language. So thank you very much. I will be very short. I try to say in five minutes about history of everything and uh, condense my message. I put the current issues. And let me begin. It was a good introduction, so I don't need to introduce myself anymore. But it was a good. I want to begin with my visit to China two years ago. I have been there several times, but this was my lecture in Nanjing and then visit to Yangzhou. I was very impressed. I want to sp start with this slide because the topic of our seminar is media lit information literacy and the alliance of civilizations. I think that civilizations is the important 
dimension that we in the Western world tend to ignore because we think that we are civilization. Europeans think that we are the center of the world. We borrowed from the Arabs culture. The Arabs brought it from India, but okay, it's, it's a common, common, everybody has a contribution. But this I like, and many of my students don't know who is Sakyamuni. They definitely know who is Aristotle. And that's all they think about is that need, what we need to know. Confucius is now coming fashionable because China finally tries to find its own civilization and not imitate colonial mentality to, in international forum. I'm very happy of that. This is a good start, and I, I was very impressed, and I was thinking what I need to learn myself, and what am I to speak to the Chinese or anybody who have thousands of years of civilization. Of course, I can speak of media, technology coming from Finland. It's, everything is technological, so that's safe. But this is something, and, and even more than that, I miss the Indian dimension. And I'm studying Ratnakrishnan, the first president professor who, also the Indians said that the Western philosophers, uh, despite of the claiming of being objective, they, they, they cannot understand Indian philosophical thinking because they have a theological bias in their own culture. I believe in that, but I'm, I'm a Westerner, I'm a European. But I want to begin with uh, the wisdom of Marco Antonio Diaz, my Brazilian colleague who was heading UNESCO higher education and created UNESCO chairs. I worked with him in, already in the 80s and a long time after. He is saying in one of the recent writings coming from China, are we creating centers of excellence with or without spirit? With or without spirit? And this is when I go to my dear friend, brothers in Egypt, what is the spirit the Sphinx is trying to communicate to the 21st century? Head, hand, heart, or what I say soul, spirit, skill. The spirit is essential, but where is the spirit? So I, I skip this over, but in the alliance of civilizations, we have to go deeper into the essence of civilizations. Maybe we cannot return. It's another tendency, sometimes dangerous. Should we go backwards? I don't, I don't speak, you have to decide, you who, who come from great civilizations, how much you want to go look backwards and how much you want to look forward. But what I wanted, and this is my very quick uh, observations from new media and this debate on going on in the Arabic world and also in, in Spain, indignados and all these things that things are changing. Gilberto Chil from Brazil, that this fragmenting, the thing is, is it really serious? Is more emotional uh, exchange of, 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 of feelings? We have a coach, we have a measure how people feel throughout the world, but we don't know analytically what need to be done, and, and the communication is no more mass communication, it's flock communication. We don't know how people behave in the flock. It's a crowd behavior, we need theory for crowd behavior. Some, some fields like philosophy, sociology are developing very fast, and the translation machines are so good. I, I use Google Translator reading Chinese or Arabic, no problem. I don't translate them into Finnish because my language is is not so developed in the Western world that it, it is not so automatically ready. That English is much more technically advanced. But English is not the language. It's just a communication. It, it's, no, it's, it's a means of communication. Language is your native language. But I can follow, and anybody can follow. So in the media literacy, I wrote, and, and I, I want to say because I, I have this board membership in the UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies in education in Moscow. And I, 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 I can influence things. I'm a board member. I suggested in our last session that in technology, which is our field of competence, we had to go deeper to the Alliance of Civilizations because it's a higher value in UNESCO. It was already first Director General Julian Huxley spoke about higher humanity and the importance of going beyond national and other borders. And now Madame Bokova has this credo of new humanism as well. But this is my, my conclusion in the vocational technical education, practical, working place skills. This I wrote, but this is, I just want to show in passing. 
But what we are doing, and I just conclude with a very brief observation, so what, what we are doing at the moment that you may not know, in the Russian Federation, I'm not representing Russia, but it's a great trade cultural civilizational area as well, they are building programs on information and technical uh, literacy and, and competence. This project that we are supporting from the center is by a Dutch colleague from University of Twente, Piet Commerce, which is ICT for teachers course and master's course. It's being very advanced and there are, this is an example of UNESCO chairs from St. Petersburg region, the Moscow region, how they organize themselves to get this done. This is by Baradovsky professor and, and myself have been teaching in Taganrog University in Russia. So there are a lot of uh, uh, possibilities to combine and my own work, well this is one more thing and before I conclude that my own team or my, I, I have retired. You, you see that being a professor once means you never pass away. You just retire, you just become emeritus. That is, that's what I am, I'm emeritus. So I continue and continue without getting paid but I get respect, respect and, and honor and all kinds of symbolic recognitions. See, we are doing an online handbook on, on, on the pedagogies of media in information literacy. Literacy is by my colleague Sirko Kotilainen, and this will be following very much the UNESCO work on, on the information literacy. And, and Jose Manuel Perez Torneo has done much in the media literacy before. So there's ongoing work all the time. Without any delays, uh, our next speaker, speaker is um, Caroline Wilson. She is a teacher educator at the University of Toronto and the um, you know, Western University of Ontario. Uh, she's involved in the Media Awareness Network in Canada and also the president of the Association of Media Literacy. She has over 20 years experience working in media literacy education and um, more recently in media and information literacy. Uh, she's one of the lead, lead authors of the UNESCO MIL curriculum and the co-editor the co of the, that curriculum. Caroline, over to you. Thank you very much, Alton, and thank you to everyone for sitting in on this session. We've had uh, quite an informative and full day already, so I uh, appreciate you being here to uh, listen to what we have to share. I have been asked to speak specifically to the work of media literacy, media and information literacy that has been taking place in Ontario, Canada, where I work, and specifically uh, what has been done to support teachers and students in media and information literacy. As you can see from the first slide, um, I believe that there is a promise of school change in all of this. I believe that there is a great potential for um, classrooms and teachers and students and education to move forward to prepare young people for life and for work today and for citizenship and solidarity in our global community. So as Alton expressed this morning, I am hopeful and excited about everything that media and information literacy represents. This next slide is, you will see, a quotation from UNESCO, and I thought I would share it because it's quite important to us in Ontario, Canada, where I work. It introduces every curriculum document that focuses on media and information literacy. So this is the introductory statement at the beginning of our language curriculum at the elementary level and our English curriculum at the secondary level. And you can see from this quotation that literacy is about more than reading or writing, as it says. It's about how we communicate and participate in culture and in our society. So what has been very important for us at home is to embrace an expanded definition of literacy, one that includes print, screen-based, and electronic media, and to embrace the ideas that UNESCO is putting forth here in this quotation. The next slide of this particular statement is, is really a working definition for us of media literacy, as we call it, although we're expanding that to embrace information literacy and all that that can bring to curriculum as well. So we're talking about uh, competencies that enable students to understand how media operate, how they construct meaning, 
how they can be used, and how to evaluate the information that they present. So we might be talking about media industries, as well as the texts or the content that those industries produce. I also wanted to mention, Alton uh, mentioned this in the introduction, but I as well wanted to acknowledge the Association for Media Literacy and point out our website address. The association is a nonprofit voluntary organization comprised primarily of people involved in education um, at the elementary, secondary, and teacher education. Uh, but it is the official subject association for teachers involved in this work. So the association is involved in lobbying uh, the Ministry of Education, working with school boards and faculties of education to ensure that the work of media and information literacy moves forward. And this is a snapshot of one of our curriculum documents. And as you can see, there are four overall expectations. These four overall statements underpin the curriculum for students in Ontario from the age of six, when they are in grade one, six years old, to uh, grade 12, when they are 17 years of age in Ontario. So media literacy is a mandated part of our curriculum for students. All students are exposed to it from grades one through grade 12. So obviously there is a significant expectation then that teachers become uh, very adept at media and information literacy, that they have those competencies themselves in order to introduce this into the curriculum as it exists. And right now, the Ministry of Education in Ontario is actually working to move these curriculum expectations across the curriculum. So it's not something that will just be housed in language or literacy but it will underpin all curriculum areas. So that is a goal for the Ministry of Education. I'm not sure how soon we'll get there, but I think it's an admirable goal. Um, the curriculum is also underpinned by something that you'll see in the UNESCO document for media and information literacy. And I think the UNESCO document is important because it does really support and allow us to uh, move forward with curriculum development um, in Ontario and in other parts of Canada. So our curriculum really focuses on three main areas, and these areas represent three sides of what we affectionately call a media triangle. So we look at production, how a text is produced, by whom and for what purpose, we look at the messages and values being conveyed through text, and we look at audiences, how audiences are targeted by media texts and industries, but how they actively respond to the media and make use of it in their own lives. So to illustrate that, we have several questions here. I'll just give you a moment to look at these. Several that illustrate what production is about what the text dimension encompasses when we look at media texts in the curriculum and what audiences might involve. So moving forward, because Alton is the timekeeper and he gave me a little gesture already. Um, one thing that I want to share with you that I thought would be interesting is something that I think um, will really be supported by UNESCO's initiatives and Tabio referred to this as well. He, he talked about Twitter and had a, si a slide for us to consider. And that is that um, social media is something that we are really going to have to embrace in education in terms of equipping young people with, with critical ways of, of thinking about and dealing with social media. Um, Joseph Catala this morning in the opening address talked about the idea that we must know ourselves, um, that that is really important in terms of underpinning our approach to social media and indeed to media in general and media education. I thought I would just say about Facebook that recent surveys um, in Canada have suggested that young people do not feel they exist unless they have a social media presence. So they do not have an identity, they do not have an existence unless they're part of the Facebook community, which I think is so interesting. 
And just a couple of other stats quickly, 73% of students in North America between the ages of 12 and 17 use social media sites. And children between the ages of 2 and 11, 10% of children that age are using social media. So for us, it has become really important to include this in the curriculum as well. So here is a sample activity that we might take students through, applying some of those questions from audience from our media triangle to a Facebook page. So how audiences are targeted, how advertising is being used, what might draw an audience to Facebook. Another interesting question linking this to a young person's identity is to think about how they are representing themselves in social media, what identity they are constructing for themselves on a Facebook page. And um, I've had one other example I thought I would show you quickly. We'll leave that at audience then. One other example I wanted to share with you, I just have a couple of minutes left, is recognize the, um, recognizing the importance also of looking at internet safety and ethics and responsibilities connected to that. The UNESCO curriculum speaks to this in, in some detail. So this has also been a priority at home to be proactive in terms of developing policies to support young people and their citizenship when it comes to social media. So thinking of their personal lives, uh, their school life and their public life, their civic life, and their responsibilities to use social media ethically and in solidarity with other users. One uh, last example I'll share with you is a notion of design curriculum that we are beginning to explore at various faculties of education. And the new media certainly is opening up possibilities for us to move beyond the classroom and to use spaces in the community as sites of learning for our students. So we're exploring um, this notion of customized student curriculum for any place, any time learning. And our own Marshall McLuhan in Canada would say, time and space has vanished. So we can break down classroom walls and explore education in non-school settings. And our curriculum speaks to that as well. And then finally, this notion of the design curriculum, I think, informs what some teachers are exploring. And that is the, the flipped classroom, where information and research can take place uh, beyond the classroom walls. We no longer have to depend on a traditional lecture format for uh, conveying information to students. And what can happen within the classroom can be activity and project based, uh, where the teacher is working alongside the students, not separate from them on the stage delivering a lecture. So I think this is an interesting thing to explore as well. So a few uh, projects, a few ideas that we're uh, working on. And finally, my last slide and my last comment is to share with you the fact that in Canada, we have started celebrating a National Media Literacy Week, which I have promised Alton I will work to expand to at Media and Information Literacy Week, which takes place every year, the first week of November. And this is sponsored by the Media Awareness Network in Ontario and the Canadian Teachers Federation. So it's a national week. It's an opportunity for us to celebrate our achievements in media and information literacy, but also uh, to review where we've come from, uh, to reflect on where we're at, and identify um, key areas and strategies for moving forward. Um, because of course, this world of media and information literacy is constantly changing. And it's a world that our, our young people will always be a part of. So um, for us, it's an opportunity to celebrate um, the work of young people, celebrate the work of teachers, but also um, to sort of uh, place a critical lens on some of our efforts and, and make uh, concentrated plans to move forward. So in that spirit, in the spirit of moving forward, I, uh, I look forward to continued discussion with colleagues this week, because I think it is through um, through meetings like this one, thanks to Jose and to Sammy, that, um, that we're able to share ideas and, and conceptualize just what the future might look like and what we have to look forward to as we move forward. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Caroline, for your informative um, presentation. I remind you, the audience, that uh, the intention is to make this session interactive. We don't want to be talking to you all the time. We want to hear from you. So um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have 30 to 40 minutes for, of discussion. So I encourage you to be noting your questions as the speakers go along, your observations, um, your inputs, um, your own experiences if you want to link to what was shared. Remember that we're looking at the integration of media and information literacy in uh, education and what are some uh, perspectives and experiences um, challenges, what are some success factors that we should look at. Our third speaker, Ms. Mr. Uh, Alfonso uh, Guterres, is also a teacher edu educator. He, wor he works on ICTs and media in teacher training, particularly as it relates to the application of ICTs and media to um, pedagogy. He has just released a publication on uh, digital literacy be beyond mice and keys. And it's quite an interesting um, topic beyond um, mice and keys, because this is what media and information literacy is about. It's, it's beyond just using the technologies and, and, and thinking about uh, a critical um, uh, analysis of, of information and critical use of media and all for, of all forms of technology. So um, over to you, Alfonso. <coughs> thank you, Alton. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for the opportunity they have given me to be here sharing this uh, time and some ideas with uh, you all. I will start by mentioning the important role teachers have to play both in today's schools and in the information, information society, as it has been pointed out already in the previous sessions. It's clear we live in a society where media have a great influence on interpersonal relationship and allow <coughs> communication through social networks. And in this kind of society, of course, any education or any literacy, if it's an education or literacy to live in the information society, has to be somehow media education or media and information literacy. I guess that we all agree that change or innovation in education would not be possible without the active implication of teachers. In this end, as you know, uh, UNESCO considers teachers as principal agents of change in the publication which has been mentioned before and uh, which has been edited by Alton Grissel and Carolyn Wilson with whom we have the pleasure to share this table today. And it's meant to be complementary, and it has to be, to the UNESCO ICT competence framework for teachers published in the 2008, sorry. I recommend you these publications. I'm sure you already know them. And they are also available in Spanish. In page 17 of Media and Information Literacy Curriculum for Teachers, we can read and you can, that media and information literacy among students requires that teachers themselves become media and information literate. Teachers need to be media literate both as citizens, citizens for themselves and as teachers for their students, as we'll see later. So it is clearly stated that teachers have to play an important role in the schools and from the schools in society by and large. And for this to be possible, teachers have to receive training on media and ICT. So teachers have to learn, on one hand, how ICT and media are and should be in the classroom. And I think we are maybe paying too much attention to this point, and we have to wait for the second one. They have to know the role media and their potential in teaching and learning mainly in the school, but also in informal education uh, within the classroom. On the other hand, teachers have to know how media and ICT are and should be in society by and large. The role and potential of media as informal education agents and their potential learning outside the school. The model or the proposal I bring here today 
is a comprehensive one where we can distinguish three main dimensions of teacher training on ICT and media. The, the teacher of the person as a teacher, but also training of the teacher as an educator, and lately the training of the educator as a person and citizen of the 21st century. The training of the person as a teacher would consist of professional, didactic, and pedagogical training. It can be achieved through the study of educational technology and the integration of media teaching and in teaching and learning. Teachers need to know how video and other ICT can be used to represent and present information and to help with teaching and learning. Transform society and affect teachers and students' lives. In our opinion, neither the curricular integration of new media nor the corresponding teacher training can be reduced to providing access to ICT and to training teachers to operate devices and use digital programs. If any teacher, not just those in the early years of compulsory education, is an educator, he or she should be trained as such in the social and educational implications of new media. Teacher training on the educational potential of media and ICT should also consider media as social phenomena that take place outside the classroom and not only as classroom resources. In the role that media can play in teaching within and outside the school is important, and that's why we have referred to training of the person as a teacher. If that role is important, I mean it is no less important the role in education, the role as educational agents, as shapers of opinions and attitudes. That's why we include training of the teacher as educator. Teacher training in media and ICT deals on with the role of new media mostly in informal education, in the shaping of opinions and wills, the role in the way that media appeal not so much to the reason as to the heart of the users. Okay. And last but not least, train of the teacher as a person and citizen of the 21st century, which has to be a, perman a permanent teacher training, which is lifelong learning. <coughs> At the present time in the information society in the so-called digital era, this basic training of the teacher as a 21st century citizen would largely consist of media and information literacy too. In page 22, of UNESCO's publication mentioned before, the author distinguished three key thematic areas of broad curriculum areas to frame the MIL curriculum for teachers. Knowledge uh, and understanding, evaluation and production. I would like to focus on production. Production and use of media and information in order to propose multimedia authoring as a basic principle of literacy for teachers and students. In my opinion, multimedia literacy can better meet its uh, objectives in both teacher training and student learning are formulated around the creation of documents, authoring and distributing information. And media literacy will contribute to cultivating free citizens if students overcome the bounds of simple reception and move on to creation if we teach teachers and students critical reception by way of authoring, not only analyzing, but authoring their own multimedia documents. A media and information literacy that gives students and teachers the ability to participate freely in the society of the third millennium and ultimately to transform it stems from being able to express themselves and from their active implication in authoring multimedia. Well, as a brief summary, I will point out 
once again that the train of the teachers on media and ICT, on media and information literacy, or what I call it, uh, digital reliteracy of teachers, whatever we call it, it should include the study of the presence, influence, and the potential of media both at the school and in society. Therefore, this training should empower the person not just to be a good teacher, but, so, but also an educator and a citizen of the 21st century. We've got one minute. Okay, thank you. Should be enough. Uh, I would not like to finish my presentation without mentioning two possible dangers or trends to be avoided in both students and teachers' media, education and training. Considering the importance given lately to restric restrictive visions of digital competence for students and teachers, we should be well aware of the danger of reducing this digital competence to its most technological and instrumental dimension. Of course, forgetting the attitudes and values. And a second danger would be to reduce media education to the development of digital competence. Media education has been considered here as a broad concept which constitutes an advanced level of media literacy and also includes digital competence and digital literacy. And finally, just to remember that it would be a big mistake, as Confucio also mentioned here before, <laughs> points out, to focus on the finger of the technology and forget about the true aims of education. In our case, the moon is learning, education, and social transformation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alfonso, for your, your presentation. Um, we're going to move into the final presentation of the session. Um, before we do this, we know that one of the realities uh, that we face in, in integrating uh, MIL in education is yeah. that we get always get the complaints from teachers that the curriculum is already overloaded. You know, every time there's some new topic, new concept, climate change, there's always something new for the teacher to, the teacher to do, and there's always this complaint, you know, there's just too much work, we just cannot do it. Uh, and so this next presentation will be about an MIL multimedia teaching resource tool to reduce the workload for teachers as we try to integrate MIL in the education system. It will be delivered by uh, Johan um, Holberg. Um, he has been involved in media and information literacy for over 20 years. Um, he and his team um, have uh, produced education materials for the Swedish gover <laughs> governmental agencies for over 15 years. Um, they've produced the radio shows and written a book on film literacy. Um, if you, he, he, he still works for, for, for teaching uh, children and students at, and teachers at, at all levels. Um, so they've done a lot of work on film literacy and if you recall from the MIL curriculum, UNESCO has been pushing for an um, harmonization of the different notions of literacy. Uh, and this is one of the confusion that we have in the education system. The policy makers, they cannot understand it because they're hearing film literacy, advertising literacy, news literacy, digital literacy, information literacy, media literacy. Now we're hearing about social network literacy. So there's so many literacies. And as an educator myself, mobile, mobile literacy, there's so many. Uh, and as an educator myself, you know, if I didn't study all these fields, I would, have, I would be totally confused. Not, not the least the policymakers. And so we are pushing for an harmonization of all these literacies and to call it media and information literacy would include these different components. So film literacy is a part of media, media, and, information, media and information literacy. Johan, we thank you. And this will be an interactive presentation, so I, I think you will, you will uh, enjoy it. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, this is a, a co production, you could say. It's a partnership with UNESCO and other partners, and uh, my most important partners in this work are my colleagues, Michael Kowalski and Frederick Homburg. So they will help me during this presentation. And so we made an, an interactive tool of this curriculum that I hope that you've all read. And uh, I think you've done a great job, Carolyn and Alton, and everybody else has been involved with it. But we're from Sweden. When these books are 
produced in Sweden, they very often just end up on a bookshelf and they collect dust. And we don't want to do that. We, we want it to be something really active, something you can use in the classroom. Um, and we want to make the ML curriculum a resource that you can use straight in the classroom. And we've um, made it more ac ap uh, applicable and easy to use than the written text alone. So we'd start by showing you a short film. Now, some say that film will pacify you, uh, but we'll take our chances, even if it's close to lunch. Chase. Unfortunately, we're raised taxes on working families. We can deal with our budget problem. <coughs> we. I could see on your reactions, you're not pacified by this film. Uh, your reactions are very real, and that's what media does to it, all kinds of medias. And a lot of the media we have around us today are multimedial. I mean, you're saying ooh and ouch and everything. We, we know that Clinton needs medical attention right now, don't we? We haven't seen that. We've just created that image ourselves in our heads because we are creative when we use different kinds of media. And a lot of them are multimedial. We, they consist of moving images, text and sound. And uh, it's important for us to, to learn how to use these um, texts and how to deconstruct them and how to read them and analyze them. And it's been said by many of the other speakers here today already. Um, we need to understand them and re regardless what kind of media it is. And the EU Commission puts it very well by saying it is one of the key prerequisites for an active and full citizenship, helping to prevent and diminish, diminish risks of exclusion from community life. And the United Nations call it a, a human right. And to have socially uh, and democratically sustain, sustainable societies, we need to, uh, uh, we need to be able to um, get our teachers and students media information literate. Uh, the organization that we come from is called Folkus Bio, which means people's cinema. Uh, we've been showing films from all over the world for uh, our 17 cinemas for 40 years. And we not many Hollywood films, because we try to show films from other parts of the world, and how to try to show the Swedish audience how we can, um, well, how other people live in the world, frankly. And for 20 years, we've been helping our audience, especially the young audience and their teachers, with analyzing and talking about the, the experiences they've had of the films that we've, that we've seen. And as we were uh, uh, pioneers in this field when we started in Sweden, we had to uh, produce quite a few of our uh, educational materials ourselves. And uh, so we started working with some of the national agencies, like the Film Institute and Swedish Consumer Agency, and most importantly, the Swedish National Agency for Education. And uh, they have an online course for a lot of teachers. Well, I, I think they have 130,000 teachers enrolled in this uh, online course right now uh, to get them media, well, the basic media literacy. And when they've sort of got the basics, they have a huge resource bank called the Multimedia Bureau where they can find lots of resources. And we have produced a majority of their resources on how to analyze media. And it was this work that uh, Alton and UNESCO saw when we met uh, at uh, the, the World Summit for, on uh, Media for Children and Youth in Karlstad two years ago. And we also had the opportunity to show it to Mr. Vladimir Guy in Paris. And uh, they wanted to see more of it. And with Swedish partners, uh, Nordicom, with Professor Ola Karlsson, and the Swedish <coughs> UNESCO Council, uh, we've been able to build this demo of a website, where, how we can make this uh, curriculum more interactive. So that's what we're going to, show you, going to show you now. This is the first page of it. 
So, Frederick. Yeah, here it is. Well, not the sound. <laughs> <coughs> we are all about uh, content, and we want we, sure, we love this idea um, when we heard about it in Karlstad, um, and we wanted to be part of it and to make it even better. We wanted to make this into a tool, to um, a teaching appliance, and um, and that's what we've tried to do with this model. Just bear in mind that it is a model, uh, a demo still, but um, you will be able to find information about how to reach the model in. Uh, can you lift up then? We have little pamphlets over here, so you can find it on your own. Just a, a, a brief orientation here. You will have the um, uh, orientation on the left all the way through wherever you come on the site. And uh, here it says, what is MIL? A frequently asked question. Um, we are online, yeah. And we have the MLA Clearinghouse uh, information there. Of course, this is a wonderful place to gather all the, the great information that is on the field. Um, and you can't teach without research, so we have a, a link to uh, Nordicom, of course, the clearinghouse. That gathers, organizes, and spreads uh, the research results on media, children media and, and youth. Well, that's basically the, the features of the, well, the, the basic features, above everything hovers the, um, the curriculum, of course, the important text. And that leads into the uh, syllabus of the core and non-core modules. And to that, I mean, we, we, we will dive into this and see some examples, of course. But we have also added some libraries, audio, print, and moving image libraries. We'll try to go into now. We, we have translated parts of this uh, into to different languages. English, French, Spanish, Arabic, and Swedish. Very important language. <laughs> so most of it is translated. Here's the Arabic page. Let's go back, Michael. And um, let's look at, at the Curriculum and Composite Framework page. It is quite empty, but we would love to make this more alive. I mean, we could use your expertise. You could have audio files here or be talking heads and, and make this more medialized as, as a page. Um, the text is interactive, searchable, and you can always, always share whatever you find on this page, wherever you go. You can always share it or print it. But let's go to the syllabus, to the core and non-core modules. Which is actually a course, isn't it? And uh, we will show you examples from module two, three, four, and five. And let's go to Module two, two. I've got my microphone here. Yeah, yes. Uh, so you can see here we had all the uh, the modules there with the units underneath, and you can go in and search. It's a very good search engine, so you can easily find whatever topic you're looking for. And you have the units on the right hand side here, so you can easily go to whatever unit you want. And I think we'll go to unit uh, three. Uh, what makes news? Exploring the criteria and uh, some of the criteria, assessing news, value newsworthiness, um, and learning the objectives is to uh, describe the criteria and uh, comparing the broadcast. We can go into the tutorial because this is what we're doing. We want to have the text there as the book, but you can read it on, in an online searchable version. But also, when you move into your module, and into your unit, we will have a resource connected to each unit. So when you read what you're supposed to do in this unit, and you have questions about that, you will have more info and exercises, you will have more um, uh, movies or whatever materials you have on the site, and tutorials. We will have at least, in the demo here, you will find at least, uh, when we finish with it, uh, we will want to have at least one um, tutorial for each unit, that's the, the goal. And in this uh, unit, we've just put a lot of um, broadcasts here. Of course, you can find them yourself, but we've collected some of the world 
uh, news uh, stations. And of course, you can do this with newspapers or radio stations, whatever you want. And here we have Spanish, Argentinian, and Chilean uh, television, and Thai, Thailand, Japan, China, and Pakistan. And you can just go in and compare. If you watched uh, news shows this morning, whatever country you wanted to, to share in, in Europe at least, Spain was topping with all kinds of different issues, but there was a lot about Spain in, in all different countries. And as you can see at the bottom of each page, you can, you can share, you can do that again. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you recognize the symbols here, and of course you can print. So wherever you are, you can move on with that. Um, okay, let's move to uh, module three, unit four, please. Um, <coughs> Media and Information Society. And the unit four is representation and music video. And uh, one of them, of course, is analyzing a music, music video. And also learning objective is what you do there with the emphasis being given to representation of gender, race, and sexuality. So let's move into the tutorial straight away. <coughs> We've chosen a, uh, the video Waka Waka, this time for Africa. The official video for the 2010 World Cup in football in South Africa. And of course, if it's a World Cup, this is one of the, the main, this is one of the largest events in the world, World Cup football. And uh, of course, it's important how you represent the world. And the question is then, when you watch this, how do you represent the world? So let's see if we can get it started. As you can see here, we won't go into it, but there's a lot to discuss here. There's lots of representations <laughs> of different kinds. So, should we move on to one of our favorite parts? This movie has been uh, seen 470 million times that. plus. Yeah, that's popular culture for you. Of course, it's very good teaching material. Uh, my favorite part, the next module, um, module four, uh, languages and media and information. Um, our area of expertise are the moving images and, and storytelling of the narratives. Um, and um, well, we watched, well, let's go to the tutorial, Michael, straight away. We have been making um, teaching materials and, and uh, for many years now. And, um, and this is, is a simple step-by-step -step, um, tutorial that goes through how to, how to teach and how to use media in the classroom. Um, we also fill this area with, with, uh, with examples to, to uh, exercise on. We have the film that we, we saw in the beginning, that we experienced together. That is a text, that's a group, that's group work. And of course, um, that text can be deconstructed. We can look at the genre, what we see, how we see it, and what we hear, the mise-en-scene. Uh, we have, it has a narrative, a beginning, a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has characters. It has the main character, a problem, and a helper, of course. And we can formulate the content in one word or, or a whole screenplay different levels of, of, of making content show. Um, so this is how we move on. But let's go to the next module again, um, advertising. In a society becoming so commercialized that ours are today, um, we need to learn how to be critical, to question, to um, towards almost everything, what we, that we, what we read, what we hear, what we watch. Um, we need to be able to be critical and question our textbooks at school, even our teachers. And um, one um, unit is about uh, public service announcements. So let's look at one.
Uh, well, how was that done? Um, who made it? Why did they make it? Uh, who paid for it? Those questions could be asked. But also, we could use it in, in a different situation. We could ask, um, we could use it to inspire, to plant new ideas. Um, we, we've tried all, all these, this content that we have here, but it's a wonderful area to, to, to share and to spread and to evaluate uh, all our te different teaching materials. So we're moving, uh, we've been moving through the uh, core and non-core modules very quickly, but as you can see, we have resources to all the different, uh, um, we will have uh, to all the different uh, units within this uh, uh, material. And that's what we want to do. We want to take uh, good materials, good films that we find out there. There's a lot of free content out in the world. We need to turn that into educational materials and write tutorials for it. Uh, we're running uh, teacher training courses at teacher training colleges in Sweden. Uh, we've started off with using this kind of work uh, with it. And we're hoping to start a, a part of a course in Tanzania uh, within, the, within a year, hopefully. But we'll have to move into the next part, which is uh, uh, the libraries. The, Im the libraries, we have audio, we have print, and we have moving images. And we'll just move into the moving image libraries because we have short on time here. And uh, we'll have a look at, uh, at uh, the themes. We've chosen the, the themes that UNESCO have in other parts. Um, uh, HIV, AIDS, women, and so on. It's just different ways of reaching the, the, the material, yeah. the, the content, really. But Minorities to and to indigenous people down at the bottom, if you click there, yeah. we're connected to the... Uh, uh, I have a film here from the Open uh, e-training platform. Um, An UNESCO address? Th yes, the UNESCO address. If you just click, you have researches, uh, resources everywhere. And everywhere you can see that it's also tagged so you can find where in the curriculum you can, where is this adaptable, where can you use this. So you can find a lot of resources there. We want to turn this into an active tool in classrooms and teacher training courses. Um, we have all the media and the uh, teaching appliances that we need all around us, all the time, for free. We just need to, to find it and share it and, and make use of it. That's what we, we do. And we need your help to fill these libraries with uh, all kinds of media content that is relevant for the different parts of the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You, you have heard uh, four presentations. Now we want to hear from you. Uh, we want to get questions um, that you can post to the, to the panels, your observations, your own experiences. Um, we have 30 minutes um, for discussion and, and uh, question and answers. I'm looking at the organizers. They're telling me 10 minutes. In fact, we're, we're, well, this is your decision. We want to hear from you, but if you only want 10 minutes, then <coughs> all right. So we'll have one round, uh, just one round of question and answers. Uh, the floor is open. Um, the resources that you have, are they available for us? I mean, we can use it in our teaching as well, or is there a cost involved? They're absolutely no. free. Oh, so we would... It is, uh, that's the point. It's free for everybody everywhere. That's the point. It's basically accessible for everybody everywhere. You've got the address here. You can look it, look it up it's later. And every, that's the, the important part. We have a leaflet here where you can have the address where you can go in and check out the demo. It will be keep, hopefully keep building on it so it will be complete. But that's the very important part. Could you please say your name? Sherry Hope Culver, Temple University, United States. Um, I'm very excited about what you showed because I have seen the book several times and I think there's wonderful information in the book, but it required, requires me to figure out a way to put the curriculum together. And it's so much nicer when you put it all together and we can access it. So I'm just thanking you and I hope that UNESCO was supporting it because it's great. Thank you. 
you have other questions? Do you have any? Uh, Maria Ranieri, uh, University of Florence, Italy. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your inspiring talks. I was surprised for all your uh, works and experiences. I have just a comment on Caroline's uh, talk. Uh, you, sh you have shown uh, um, the three main dimensions of uh, media literacy, and I was wondering uh, whether we need a new keyword, which is network or networking, so text, uh, production audience and probably network in order to include uh, something which is uh, coming out now uh, and uh, that you mentioned uh, that you mentioned at the end of your uh, talk which is Facebooking <laughs> by uh, the new generations so I think that to catch this new dimension we should uh, add a new word in our description of the main dimensions of media literacy education today that's just a comment um, a point to discuss with you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, yes, you can respond. Am I on? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, you are on. Yes, okay. you are. Very good. Um, thank you for your comment. I think the whole idea of networking and Facebooking, as you said, and tweeting, and you know, all of that is, is very interesting and something that we do, I think, have to begin exploring more with students, of course, not to let go of traditional forms of communication. Um, Alton has reminded us many times of, of uh, the inequities that exist in the world in terms of access to new technologies. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind, um, as well as, as your suggestion about using networking. For um, our work now in faculties of education, that, that notion of networking is inherent in audience and in production because it's what, uh, what an audience member would do, what a user of the media would do. Um, so they may be a target audience, but also an active audience in terms of their response or their networking initiatives. <coughs> Similarly, if we think of, of young people as audiences as producers, um, they may be producing messages that then are part of social media. So it's, uh, I sort of think of, um, some of the social media platforms as really just that, sort of a carriage for media texts and messages that, that young people are conveying. The action is networking, but the content is still, um, you know, a media literacy text that they have to produce and think carefully about. But thank you for your comment. It was really interesting, thought-provoking. You spoke about uh, uh, the, the teachers, the training for teachers. And I guess that the point is not to have a good teacher, but uh, to have uh, um, always and always updated teachers to the new ways of communication and of education. Uh, I guess that this is uh, strictly connected with the politics that can decide about the ministerial education programs. So this is a question for all these uh, meeting for all these organization for all of us how we can uh, influence or have a <laughs> some uh, uh, a real concrete changing in uh, new ways of uh, these programs yeah briefly yeah you are right we depend on politicians but in in our case in spain i think uh, any university professor i wouldn't say can do whatever he wants or she wants but uh, almost. I mean, we've got uh, something we call libertad de cátedra. I, I wouldn't know how to say that in English, and I wouldn't be able to explain what it is like, but uh, within uh, ICT and media teacher training, most of teachers in Spain would do ICT training, more the technological side, and uh, I, I tend to do media education or media training or media information literacy or reliteracy for uh, teachers, both in initial and uh, uh, permanent teacher training. We've got the teacher center here in Spain, too, I work with. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Perhaps we can take two more questions before we close the session. There's a lady at the front here. I'm sure some of you are experts and you have been working to integrate um, media information literacy in schools. Could you, is there someone who could share some of your experiences? How did you go about doing that? What have been the successes or the challenges? 
mine is uh, just a curiosity. I'm uh, Sarah from UNESCO Bangkok, mm. and um, for Caroline. Um, I've now been in the media literacy in sphere in Asia. I'm Italian, and I was wondering, since this forum is also about sharing lessons, um, what would you advise to, the, to Europe, or especially in Italy? How do we establish a media literacy education on the, I'm not saying on the Canadian model, but in Canada it's well established. And how do we, what would you recommend us? What would you recommend Italy in this case? How do we proceed? Well, the Ontario very experience. Very interesting question. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. The Ontario experience would suggest that um, success comes from a grassroots movement. So in Ontario, the success, the place of media literacy education in the curriculum is really thanks to quite a small, uh, dedicated group of teachers who formed the Association for Media Literacy some 30 years ago and began lobbying and working and sharing their ideas with colleagues, with other students, holding small meetings and conferences and eventually lobbying the Ministry of Education. And uh, these are people involved in the association who came before me. So the, the really the success of media literacy in Canada is, is due to them in large part, to them and to the people at the Ministry of Education that they worked with. But um, I think it really does have to come from the grassroots, from teachers who are practicing media literacy education, who know what it's about, who can articulate its benefits for young people and for students of all ages and who are, are really involved in, in the life and, and the work of, of media literacy education. I think it needs to start with, with teachers. Um, the association involved teachers, included parents and people working in the industry as well. And fortunately, there were sympathetic people with the Ministry of Education who were willing to listen. But as Alton mentioned in my introduction, some of my colleagues have been working in media literacy education for 30 years, over 30 years actually, because now this is 2012, 40 years or, or 45 years. I've been involved for about 25 years now. And, and so it, you know, it, it was a long and, and evolving effort and a long journey, um, but there were many successes along the way which inspired them. And, um, and that grassroots core of educators is still intact and still together in Toronto. Um, so there is something to be said for that when teachers come together and network and, uh, and share their ideas. So that's what I would recommend based on our experience. Well, thank you very much, and I will take that back to my colleagues in Canada. They'll appreciate that. Okay, we'll take the final question or observation from the floor. Michael. My name is uh, Michael Huxman. I'm at Lakehead University in Ontario, Canada. And um, I just want to sort of take the democratic impulse to ask a question of Tapio, who hasn't been asked one yet, and also to allow him to sort of conclude at the end. And uh, this idea of a new humanism, I mean, we're in this era right now of unprecedented information flow, and you said something about fragmentation. So is this an area, era of enlightenment? I mean, what is the possibility, and to what extent, what are the challenges? And I know that's probably a bigger question than you can answer in a brief wrap-up, but in relation to some of these really fabulous um, commentaries that we've just heard, I just thought, put uh, the, the parole back to you, the word back to you. Well, I'm not only... Not only <laughs> but people, uh, I, I can change my. I, I got very briefly. I, uh, is there many people? Many people? Many people? <laughs> this is on now. No, I. Okay. It was I I'm on. a professor in technology, so <laughs> who, who is teaching me? But the thing is that um, not only me, but I, I would I would refer to Elise Paulding in, in U.S. in the Columbia University. He retired and emeritus. She she wrote already in 1980. Aid, the book of uh, uh, global uh, something global civil, global civic society, and and no one culture can impose the value system over others. If you want to build a global civic society, and the global education is something that UNESCO and educators must be concerned of. What we are talking here is very much learning, 
that's a different thing. We learn all the time. Education is a value-based activity. And no government want to give it away without having a say. And this, what I try to say uh, in the new humanism is also that, how do we look forward to the global, global values if there are any? And the idea, and this is the thesis, and I want to close with this sentence, but when, when Huxley took over UNESCO as the first director general after the Second World War, you remember it was created during the war, was that there was lack of hum loss of values, and, and he looked for higher humanity. For him, humanity, higher humanity was atheist. At that time, it was fashionable to be materialistic. I don't share the materialistic approach, but I share the concern. And I ask if others believe in something, and we don't believe in anything, who are we to tell the others that you are wrong? What kind of values we are promoting in education? So I, I want to leave it on that. I want the answer from China, I want the answer from India, from Russia, from elsewhere. Who, who have to decide what kind of global society they want to build and contribute in, in cultural, civilizational terms, not in political terms, in narrow sense. I, I don't know if this answer answers anything, but there's no one answer. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that, uh, Tapio. We're going to close the session. It's a good note to close on. Uh, this is a Media and Information Literacy and Intercultural Dialogue Week. And I think it's important to bring that perspective of intercultural dialogue um, into focus and, and to foreground that. So we're going to end the session with a final remarks from the panel, 10 seconds each, literally 10 seconds. And the question is, what would, what would be one strategy that you'd recommend that in integrating MIL into education, one strategy to ensure that the intercultural dimension is not lost? One strategy that you'd recommend in integrating MIL into education to ensure that the, the intercultural component is not lost. Who wants to start? You have to enjoy intercultural <laughs> <laughs> You have to enjoy. Next speaker. Uh, I think we should look at uh, mention uh, popular culture. Finally, Carolyn. Um, I would say be open to continued learning and to the possibilities that arise from moving from uh, the model of critical autonomy, when students and teachers perhaps operated on their own, to critical solidarity, as we have the opportunity now to connect with teachers and students from around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, speaker and panelists, and thank you so much for your patience. And I know you're dying for hunger, so please enjoy your meal. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs>